Our encouragement this morning is from our own beloved Reverend John. Please help me welcome him to the podium. Thank you. To the lecturer. <laughs> Good morning, family, and happy Heroes Weekend. It is, yes, tomorrow is here. A special welcome to, to those who join us in consciousness on the World Wide Web. It's just wonderful to share with all of you this morning, and I'm especially looking forward to a musical treat from our Brandenburg uh, singers this morning, too. Welcome. In the early 1980s, you know, when HIV AIDS um, first surfaced here in Jamaica, and no one knew exactly what it was, how it was transmitted, or how to handle it, a group of friends, including our own beloved, um, the late Howard Daly and myself, and Larry Chang, who used to be here as well, now lives abroad, uh, and myself, we took on the responsibility of caring for a sick friend in the hospital, because at the time, the level of fear and ignorance was so high that the nurses and hospital attendants wouldn't touch him. Our early efforts led to the formation of Jamaica AIDS Support, which is now known as Jamaica AIDS Support for Life. And I'm so blessed to have been a part of those early efforts. I learned a big lesson in truth from my involvement at that time. And the friend who we were helping to look after and who subsequently passed away gave me a book of inspirational quotes. And on the inside cover, he wrote, for John the Beloved, just because, dot, dot, dot. I had just started coming here to the Temple of Light. It was 1981. And I had a big learning. The metaphysical interpretation of that just because wasn't lost on me. And I said to Reverend Elma, I said, look at this. This is a message from the universe to just be cause. And so I've entitled my encouragement today, Just Be Cause. Once again, the world led by the sensational, sensationalist news media seems to be whipping itself into a fear-filled frenzy. This time, it's over the Ebola virus. We in Jamaica, never to be outdone, appear to be adding our own apprehensions to the spreading stain of fear that threatens to take over human consciousness even faster than the dreaded disease itself. A letter from Dr. Ken Gordon, the spiritual leader of Centers for Spiritual Living to all Centers for Spiritual Living ministers, puts the Ebola scare into perspective and reminds us that as a spiritual community, we are called to be cause. We are called to be, to be cause to compassion. We are called to be cause to a deeper faith and a greater love for a world that needs us now more than ever. He begins by quoting Franklin D. Roosevelt, who said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, unquote. And I wish to read you part of Dr. Ken's letter. The spread of the Ebola virus is something to pay attention to without fear, but with diligence and compassion. We must bring the best of our faculties, personnel and collective to bear so that human suffering is relieved. We must also understand that escalating fear will inhibit our ability to bring those faculties fully to bear on this situation at home and around the globe. Fear divides, paralyzes, and seeks to blame. Compassion invites us to see those in the, in the path of disaster as our brothers and sisters, and to recognize that how we respond to each other is a measure of our spiritual depth and social maturity. Then Dr. Ken quotes Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great teaching, and I quote, if you will take time daily to sense the presence of life within you, to believe in it, to accept it, it will not be long before the life which you have known will gradually disappear and something new will be born, a bigger, better, and more perfect you. 
You will pass from death into life, from lack and want into greater freedom, and from fear into faith." Unquote. We must turn our thoughts and actions, Dr. Ken says, to something greater than fear. Focus our minds on resolution rather than the problem. We do have the capacity to generate a positive response to this disease by stepping beyond our fear and into our collective power. There is a wisdom within us that we understand to be the wisdom of God. In times of challenge, it is important to rely not only on our human creativity and ingenuity, but to know that it is inspired by the infinite intelligence we collectively know as God. Let us then work together to face this issue from a place of deep compassion and great love, to give the healthcare workers the training and equipment they need to treat those affected, to adequately fund and equip the brave people on the ground in Africa where the outbreak is centered, to support our leaders in taking these actions in a way that transcends political ideology, and to know that the love intelligence of God is working through everyone involved to bring forth the revelation of wholeness and peace. End of Dr. Dr. Ken's uh, letter. There, my friends, from our spiritual leader is a call for each of us to respond to fear by being caused to greater compassion, by being caused to greater love and a deeper knowing that God is in charge and God is truly all there is. This weekend, we celebrate our national heroes as well as our countless unsung heroes, and it occurs to me that none of them set out with the intention of being heroes or doing heroic things. They did what they did, forging new paths and creating new paradigms which significantly impacted the future of Jamaica and shaped our history just because they had a vision fueled by a passion for justice, freedom, and equality. As students of New Thought, we know that each of us is caused to our experience, and that if we don't like the experience we are having, we can create a new experience by using our minds to initiate a new cause. When I first found this teaching 33 years ago, I awakened to two simple but life-altering truths. The first was that God is all there really is. The second truth, which seriously changed the direction of my life, was coming to an understanding of the law of cause and effect, which creates my experiences in life by means of my individualized use of its awesome power. This means that what is going on within us at the spiritual, mental, and emotional level will eventually manifest in our outer world of experience clothed as conditions, events, encounters, and the circumstances of our very lives. I have to admit that at first the concept that I am the sole cause of all my experiences was a very hard frog to swallow. Until I realized that this was a truly empowering concept, for if I am the sole cause to my own effect, then I can change the effect by simply initiating a new cause, and no one can do a thing about it. Mind you, the changes for the better that I began experiencing in my life required a willingness to let go of that which no longer served me in an uplifting and life-affirming healthy way. In his book, The Art of Being, Science of Mind author Dr. Dennis Merritt Jones writes, and I quote, Manifesting any kind of peace, inner or outer, will require some form of deep letting go of our attachments to something. That something, he explains, could be as intangible as a belief or an expectation of others, or it could even be an old resentment that you need to let go of today. On the other hand, the something that you need to let go of could be as tangible as money or property, and sometimes it may even be a person or a relationship. Whatever it is, letting go is an important prerequisite for manifesting and maintaining peace, prosperity, and fulfillment in your life. 
Of course, the converse is true. Hanging on too tightly to anything or anyone will become cause to the effect of conflict, unhappiness, and pain. So in either case, the same law is at work. As within, so without. One of my favorite stories about letting go may be familiar to you, but like all good teaching stories, it bears repeating. Two monks were walking at sunrise by the banks of a stream swollen by the October rains when they spied a young woman standing in the middle of the stream. She was holding up her heavy skirt, which was dripping with icy water. She had lost her footing while trying to scramble from rock to rock, and tears of fright dripped down her beautiful face. The older monk hitched up his robe, strode out into the stream, and scooped up the woman in his arms. Having carried her safely across, he deposited her gently on the other bank, she thanked him with great relief, and the two monks resumed their journey. When the sun set and the monks were re released from the vow of silence they kept during daylight hours, the younger monk turned to his brother with fury, shaking his fist and shouting, how could you, how could you have picked up that woman? You know we have vowed never to even look at a woman, let alone touch one. You have broken your vows, sullied the honor of our order, and offended almighty God. The older monk smiled patiently at the younger man and replied, my dearest brother, I put that woman down on the other bank of the stream 10 hours ago. You are the one that has been carrying her around all day. So this brings me to your assignment. Not asking you to carry a lady around all day, gentlemen. Since we have a long weekend, I have a three part assignment, but there's really three short parts. The first part of your assignment, should you decide to undertake it, is a mindfulness practice recommended by Dr. Mer Merritt Jones, which you can do every day this week as part of your spiritual work. And this is it. Make a conscious effort to breathe deeply with mindfully. Just observe your breath for a few moments. And as you draw a deep breath in, hold it and ask yourself, what am I clinging too tightly to today? Listen without judgment. And if you ask with sincerity and you listen with an open mind and heart, you will hear exactly what is calling you to task to become the cause of your own experience of peace. And so as you release your breath, see yourself releasing whatever came forward in your awareness. And if nothing comes forward, see yourself releasing anything that no longer serves your highest good. So breathe in, hold it, ask yourself, what am I holding on too tightly to today? And if anything comes to you, breathe out and say, I release and let go. If nothing comes, just see yourself as releasing whatever no longer serves your highest good. The second part of your assignment is to pause just for a moment every time you hear or read anything about chikungunya or the Ebola virus and simply say, God is all there is. I choose love instead of fear. Let us say that together. God is all there is. I choose love instead of fear. Every time you hear it on the news or you read it in the papers or you hear any mention of it, just stop and say it quietly to yourself. God is all there is. I choose love instead of fear. We have to stem this flood of fear and this constant. I'm guilty of it myself. Everybody compares their symptoms from Chick V. Did you have the rash? Oh God, I had the sweats one night. I can't tell you. My bedclothes were dripping wet. Um, it's almost as if we delight in sharing, you know, how badly we had it. And then I, I met a, a friend of mine who is a, a W amputee. She has no legs from the knees down. And she's a well-known uh, person in the Combined Disabilities Association. We're in the supermarket and she said, well, I never had any pains in my ankles. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> so assignment part one, breathe in mindfully, hold your breath and ask silently, what am I clinging too tightly to? And then exhale it, let it go. Assignment part two, whenever you hear any mention of Ebola or Chick V, pause and simply choose love instead of fear. I'll give you part three before I close. I'd like to keep you in suspense. 
You see, friends, as Dr. Merritt Jones puts it, quote, we are each but microcosms of the macrocosm. Our world is no different than any of our personal lives in the respect that peace on our planet will continue to elude us as a species until we as individuals make peace within ourselves, unquote. Which is why we in this movement have such an important job to do of holding the high watch for our country and indeed for all humankind. When we come to the recognition that God is truly all there is, we come to a sense of peace and the assurance that the presence and power is truly the center and circumference of our daily lives. As this happens, we begin to experience the expansion of our consciousness in much the same way that the beautiful Jesus explained the kingdom of heaven in the one line parable found in Matthew chapter 13, verse 13. You may remember it, very short, and I quote, Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. End of that scripture. According to Roca Erico, the Aramaic scholar, the term kingdom of heaven in Aramaic, the language spoken by Jesus, is Malkutha Dashmaya, which is not a reference to a place one goes to after death. It means the kingdom of God or God's sovereign council. So Jesus was likening God's majesty to a woman doing an ordinary everyday chore, making bread. She would prepare the dough and hide the leaven in three measures of flour, then simply wait for it to rise. Incidentally, three measures of flour equals 50 pounds. Jesus, is, it, it, Jesus, in typical Middle Eastern style, exaggerates to make the point more impressive that God's presence within you works secretly and can make you rise to undreamed levels of excellence. All that is required of you is to just be cause. Let us affirm, today I am willing to just be cause. Together? Today I am willing to just be cause. I am caused to peace. I am caused to peace. I am caused to love. I am caused to love. I am caused to joy. I am caused to joy. I am caused to health. I am caused to health. I am caused to a better Jamaica. I am caused to a better Jamaica. I am caused to a world that works for everyone. I am caused to a world that works for everyone. To your neighbor say, God within me loves you just because. Thank you for being. God within me loves you just because. Thank you for being. God within me loves you just because. Thank you for being. I want to close with the words of a great man who answered the call to just because is the right honorable Marcus Mazaya Garvey, born in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica in 1887. In his short 52 year lifespan, he rose to become one of the world's most influential leaders. His brilliant oratory, his grasp of philosophy, and his newspaper, Negro World, founded in 1920, brought him millions of followers all over the world. In fact, you know, legend has it that Garvey's organization was and is the largest international organization of all times. I don't know if that's uh, still verifiable. This quote is taken from his writing on the function of man. To me, a man has no master but God. Man in his authority is a sovereign Lord. As for the individual man, so of the individual race. This feeling makes man so courageous, so bold, as to make it impossible for his brother to intrude upon his rights. So few of us can understand what it takes to make a man. The man who will never say die. The man who will never give up. The man who will never depend upon others to do for him 
what he ought to do for himself. The man who will not blame God, who will not blame nature, who will not blame fate for his condition, but the man who will go out and make conditions for himself. If 400 million Negroes can only get to know themselves, to know that in them is a sovereign power, is an authority that is absolute, then in the next 24 hours, we would have a new race. We would have a nation, an empire, resurrected not from the will of others to see us rise, but from our own determination to rise irrespective of what the world thinks. End of that brilliant quote. My friends, yeah. may the leaven of God's sovereign power within you cause you to rise to your fullest potential. We are called to just because. God loves you and so do I, just because. Namaste.